So I have started the recording. No question from the previous lecture. Everything is fine. Okay, so now let us start today's lecture. Today's lecture, we will start introducing Fourier transforms. So Fourier series has been done. Continuous time Fourier series we have completed. We will look at discrete time Fourier series after we have finished Fourier transforms. Okay. So, so far we are in the continuous time world and we will like to remain in this world for a few more lectures and then we will move to discrete time signals. So, let us see and recap few of the things that we have learned. So, let us look at this signal. This is a periodic signal. Okay with period capital T. Simple signal. We have also calculated its Fourier series coefficients. Right, we have done this. So the Fourier series coefficients of this signal is this. I think I have written this in terms of D also. So duty cycle sync K pi D. Right, so you can see that this is same as this thing. So if I plot the line spectrum of AK versus K, the line spectrum will be something like this. I, I could have plotted AK versus K or AK versus Omega. One and the same thing, right? Because every K corresponds to a complex sinusoid at a frequency k omega naught. Right? So I, you, you could choose x axis as per your convenience. And the envelope of this line spectrum will be sync because of this. Right? We have seen this, right? Any question here? No. So when we looked at Fourier series, and as we will motivate in this lecture, this Fourier series is for periodic signals. And Fourier transforms is for aperiodic signals. At least this is how I will like to motivate for some time and then I will say all of this is stupid. Okay, but it's it's a good way to start and introduce these things and then I will say that this is not completely correct. Okay, so we have to wait for some time to arrive at that situation. So this we have seen Fourier series for periodic signals. We have seen this. And now we are going towards Fourier transforms, which are basically for aperiodic signals. OK. Now, this is the AK as I have said in the last slide. And what I am doing is something very trivial. I can take this T to this side. And I can write it like this. OK. And instead of K omega naught, I can choose a variable omega. I can do that. 
So I can write it like this. Not any complicated change. And I can plot AKT. I can plot this versus Omega. Right? Everything remains same. This is just another way of uh, representing a line spectrum. Now let me do something. Let us say that I have a particular periodic signal. So this is also periodic. With some period T, something like this. And let us say that I have a certain line spectrum for this. Remember that these lines will be separated by omega naught, where omega naught is 2 pi by t. Okay. This is the line spectrum. Here the axis is omega, right? Now, let me do one experiment, thought experiment. Let me try to increase the period of the signal. What would happen? If I say I increase T, capital T, what would happen? The lines will become closer, right? Because omega naught will decrease. As T increases, omega naught decreases. And hence, the lines will increase the number of lines. So that's what I'm doing. I increase my period. So I get a signal something like this periodic signal and what I see here is that the lines are increasing or the density of lines is increasing because omega naught is becoming smaller. Now let me do something else. I further increase the lines. Uh, I further increase the T. If I further increase the T what would happen? Lines will become even closer. Right. And now the final step is let me choose the T to be infinity. This T to be infinity. If I choose this T to be infinity, what should happen? I should get a continuous spectrum. OK, no lines. Instead of a discrete spectrum, what I will get a continuous spectrum. Now what has happened to this signal? This is periodic with period T, capital T, where T tends to infinity. So this is an aperiodic signal. And what has happened to the spectrum? Its spectrum becomes continuous. That's the first very simple thought experiment. I have not made any, uh, or I haven't used any complicated thing here to explain this. This is obvious. So now let me present two important conclusions which should stick in your brain or mind forever, possibly, if can, if you can retain this. A pure, a, a periodic signal a periodic will have a continuous spectrum and the tool will be Fourier transforms analysis tool periodic signal will have line spectrum or a discrete spectrum and this should be analyzed by Fourier series OK. Now. Let us try to derive equations for Fourier transforms. Any questions so far? No. Suppose I have a periodic signal. Something like this. Now this signal is time limited. 
Okay, time limited means that this is non zero only in a finite time. For example, let us say if I have a period like this, outside this period, this will be zero. Okay, so I'm assuming my signal to be time limited. That's the first important thing. Okay, for deriving these equations. And let us say that this time limitation, this time period for which this is non zero is capital T. So let us assume that we have an aperiodic signal like this. Of course, I am making some simplifications here. You may ask whether whatever I am deriving, is it valid for signals which are not time limited? For example, if I have a signal XT something like this, you can have a signal, right? Which goes in forever. Deriving the equations for this signal is complicated and we will not do this. But we will make a claim, a simple claim that whatever I say for this signals will be valid also for this case. Of course, in certain conditions which we will point out. OK. So this case is harder to think about. We will not think about such cases. We will focus our attention to these kind of cases. OK. And you can imagine engineers, why should they worry about these cases? Should engineers worry about these cases? No. Because any signal you will create in the lab or you will use in practical situation will be time limited. The signal cannot go from minus infinity to plus infinity. Right, so any practical signal will be time limited anyway, and let us stick to the time limited signals. However, you can you approve using Plancherel's theorem and other complicated things that whatever we say for this kind of case is also valid for this kind of case. OK, so let's start with time limited signal. Uh, sir, the capital T region you have marked, so in this also some part is zero, right? Yeah, some part is zero. Yes, but I am saying I have taken a signal which is time limited to capital T. That means outside this capital T it is zero. Within this, I do not worry. Yeah, okay. Sir. Okay. So now it's a very important step that I am doing. And this is step we will use several times in this course. And this step is known as periodic extension. This has got a name. OK, so what is a periodic? What is periodic extension? You take. A signal. OK, let me denote this as a cap. OK. So I have this cap, which is the signal in this time period T. And what I do now, I put these caps. OK. I put these caps. At intervals of capital T. Forever. And thus, I'm converting. An aperiodic signal to a periodic signal, right? So if my signal is time limited. Within a certain time period T. I can. Create replicas of this these signals. At multiples of this capital T. And I can create a periodic signal, right? This is known as periodic extension of an aperiodic signal. So you can see that XPT, this P denotes that this is a periodic signal. It's a periodic signal. OK, this was an aperiodic signal. So this is the strategy that you can use to convert an aperiodic signal to a periodic signal. Any doubt you are free to stop me at any time. 
if you're not asking questions, I will go on a free flow. OK. So now let us look at these two equations which we have seen already. This equation and this equation. One is analysis and another one is synthesis equation. So these equations are for Fourier series. We have seen this already. And we can always use these equations because XPT is a periodic signal, right? So we can use it. Now let me play some tricks. First, let me try to analyze this equation. This is a simple equation from Fourier series. Again, I repeat XPT is a periodic signal. I can use the same equation. No problem. And the period of this is capital T because it was periodic with capital T. XPT is periodic signal with capital T. OK, so everything is straightforward. Omega not here is 2 pi by T, right? Let me play some tricks. XT and XPT. They are the same signal in this period, in this period of T, right? They are the same signals, right? You remember XPT was something, XT was something like this. And XPT is also something like this in this period. And then you have other copies, right? So XT, this and XPT, they are same within this period, within this time interval. So what I can do, instead of XPT here, I can have XT. Clear? Very simple exercise. Step three is because xt, this signal only exists between minus t by 2 to capital T by 2, minus t by 2 to plus t by 2. Instead of this limit, I can change the limit to minus infinity to plus infinity. I can do that. Right? Sir? Yes. Sir, I read out. Sir, suppose uh, this uh, time limited signal uh, covered like uh, I mean it was from minus. Like I mean this this is uh, one part of that periodic signal uh, which we have done a periodic extension. Suppose it consisted of two such parts. Then uh, when we do the periodic extension, then how would we do that? Like then we would have the period to be two times the normal period, right? Right. Uh, we can what, consider what that mean? entire Sorry? thing as one cycle now. Mm, then would that be? Would we do that, or we will take the half? No. Xt is a periodic signal with whatever period it has. Let us say it's uh, sorry. Xt is an aperiodic signal. It's not a periodic signal, and it any aperiodic signal will have a finite time support, right? Mm, yes. And that finite time support is capital T and you can always create an periodic signal out of this aperiodic signal by creating its replicas. At integer multiples of T, I didn't understand your question. Why do you think XT will have two parts and so on and so forth? No, so like suppose here we have a one triangle and like similar triangle we had uh, like two the concatenation of two such triangles was my XT. Yeah, so this is your XT, right? Yes, sir. Yes. And we are replicating this. Uh, so then in the final one, we will have copies of this, which will have a uh, time period to be half of the uh, half of the that of we find out by replicating. I mean, yeah, yeah, sure. So now I understand. Suppose XT is something like this. And again, to generalize, I can have it like this. OK. Mm. Now, if I do its periodic extension, so this is the question. So I will have a situation created like this. 
where it may seem that I can take the period instead of capital T, I can take its period as T by 2. Okay, is this your question? Yes, sir. Yeah, it doesn't matter. For example, in AK, if you are integrating this in this interval, and if you're dividing by capital T, or if you if you integrate this in this interval and divide by t by 2, your a case will not change. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. The simplest, uh, simplistic thing to do is just to integrate in one period in t by 2. If you have that's fundamental period is t by 2, then the simplistic thing is to integrate this in one period and divide by its length. That's the simplistic thing, but it will not change. Uh, the values of AK will not change whether you integrate of let's say for five periods and divide by the length of five periods or 10 periods or 100 periods or whatever. OK, here we are saying that we. Integrate this in this period, period of T, and then we divide this by capital T. It doesn't matter. OK. Yes, I got it. Thank you. OK, so. XT was this and then I changed the limits from minus infinity to plus infinity. Any other question on this? No, fine. Now if I look at this equation, this is what I had in the previous slide. And if you remember some previous lectures, I have defined this integration right in the course as h omega. And I have claimed that this is the frequency response. OK, and we have also seen a reason why this is known as the frequency response. If this is the impulse response, this will be the frequency response. Now, if I believe into this definition, I have to believe this because this is how I've defined this, right? So this signal would be defined as x omega. Right. So what is this AK? So if you look at this part of the integral, this part of the integral will be nothing but x k omega naught. Right? Because when this was omega, this was omega. Now here it is k omega naught. So I have to put in k omega naught here. So AK will be this. Right? This is the step four. Any confusion to anyone? Hopefully not. It's very simple. Now, XPT, a periodic signal, I know can be using Fourier series, can be written as summation AK e to the power JK omega naught T, right? So AK we have calculated. This is this thing. Just have shown this. Right. So XPT will be this signal. Clear. So far I haven't done anything complicated. So if you were four year yourself, you could have derived all these steps if you know for a series. Now again, the next step is also very simple. I know that capital T is two pi by omega naught. So instead of writing this in terms of T, I can write this in terms of omega naught. So what did I do? I just have put T equals to 2 pi by omega naught and I get this equation. OK, now next step is also very simple. What happens if T, this capital T is infinity? Because then we are going to a periodic signals, right? If T capital T is infinity. If capital T is infinity, XPT will become XT. Then there will be same signals. OK. What would happen to K omega naught? This will become and so this is a discrete quantity K omega naught because this takes in values only for integer values of K. 
But if omega naught is very small, then this k omega naught will become a continuous quantity omega. Omega naught will become d omega. All these steps you must have done. And summation will become integration. Fine. So instead of thinking about the equation like this, what will happen if my capital T tends to infinity? Then I can write the equation like this. So 1 by 2 pi is intact. Summation converting to integration. K omega naught is becoming X omega. K omega naught is becoming omega. So X K omega naught is becoming X omega. This will change to omega. Omega naught will change to D omega. Very simple. Derivation of Fourier transform from Fourier series is very simple. So if you have understood this equation, then we are done. So in 4A series, so this part is this part is 4A series. 4A series. So let me put P here. OK, a periodic signal can be thought in terms of a case. And for a transform XT. Can be constructed or can be thought in terms of X of Omega. And we already know what is X of Omega. X of omega is defined to be this quantity. So this is the synthesis equation. And this is the analysis equation. For Fourier transforms and these are the synthesis and analysis equation for Fourier series. OK. Any question? Oh, Can you show fine. the previous slide once? Previous slide, yes. Yeah, okay, sir. Okay. This, again, this is not completely true, but this is how it has, uh, how it will be taught to you in many textbooks, so I use the same thing. So when we convert omega to T, so omega space to T space, this is this equation is known as inverse Fourier transform. And when I go from T space to omega space, this is known as Fourier transform. OK, if you want, you can note this thing down. OK, so. Now. Let me try to understand the physical meaning of X of Omega because this is confusing to several students. Physical meaning, what is the physical meaning of this X of Omega? So AK, we know that this is this, right? And instead of T, I can write this in terms of omega naught. OK. When T tends to infinity, again the same step. Instead of K, I will get a continuous variable. And this will become X omega, this quantity. Omega naught will become D omega. Right, so I get this equation. So I can also write this like this. Now we already know from Fourier series that a k is they were the amplitudes right of the complex exponentials if a omegas were the amplitudes of the complex exponentials what should be x omega x omega should be amplitude spectral density because x omega we can write this as Right, so we are dividing amplitude by 
frequency. So this d omega is frequency, radiant frequency or something. Okay. Because of this 2 pi by d omega, you can also write this as a omega by df. It's one and the same thing. So here we are dividing amplitude with frequencies. So this should have got the unit of 1 by hertz. Right? So x omega is actually amplitude spectral density. It is not the amplitude. This thing you have to keep in mind. OK. It's an important idea. Usually for continuous things. We have a density function. OK, for example, uh, in 12th standard. You might have seen that if you have. A certain charge Q capital Q. Is spread all over the line. Then we talk about the charge in terms of charge density, linear charge density and so on and so forth. So similarly, here we talk about, so X omega is amplitude spectral density, not the amplitude. Okay. Now one or few small points. I think I'm going too fast today. So you have to stop me. So if I look at these two equations which we have derived. So we can suppose we have a signal XT. OK, any signal XT. And suppose I calculate its X omega. OK, using this equation. Then if I put in X omega in this equation. I get a signal XT tilde. That means there is some error signal produced, which is simply the difference between XT and XT tilde. See, these two equations represent the transforms. So from XT, I should be able to go to X omega, and from this X omega, I should be able to get to XT. This should be true, otherwise there is some problem, right? You have a nice signal XT and you have constructed out X omega for this and from that X omega you should be able to think about XT. So these are transforms equations. And suppose when I plug these two things in this equation and I get a signal XT tilde which is different from XT, that means there is some error. OK, and what I ideally want is this error signal to be zero for all values of t. This is what we will want. We want E t to be zero. For all values of t. But will this be like this? Right, not necessarily. OK. So there are certain conditions in which. You can. Think this in this term, otherwise it may not be true. In general, it may not be true. OK. So let us understand when this will be guaranteed to be true. So again, like in Fourier series. If my XT is square integrable. That means if this is. Finite. Or if XT has a finite energy. Then this is guaranteed that what is guaranteed if XT has a finite energy? It is guaranteed that energy of ET will also be tending to zero. OK. Energy of ET will be guaranteed to be tending to zero. If XT has a finite energy, that's one way to talk about convergence of Fourier transforms. Sir. Yeah. Um, sir, I had a doubt. So here, um, generally, when we are talking about continuous time Fourier series, like our main aim is that we'll convert the Fourier series into some discrete line spectrum so that we are able to analyze because our computer is able to store discrete signals, right? Yeah. Then, sir, in Fourier transforms, we have a uh, time limited signal. Then why are we converting it into a continuous line spectrum? Like how would that benefit us? 
this is a very very good question and i appreciate this question at this time so you are completely correct that fourier transforms are useless right from signal processing point of view you see i i want to talk about this uh, sometime in the past but because this question has been raised let me clear this thing up so the question is what is the relevance of fourier transforms for engineers because you see x omega x omega will be a continuous time signal now if we have a continuous time signal we cannot store this in computers right we cannot do this so all this whatever we are studying is for a reason which will become clear after a while not at this stage so this x omega will be something which will be useful uh, useless for engineers because you cannot store this signal at all in computers and so on and so forth so as shrimanti has suggested that we should be talking about fourier series but if you look at fourier series also we have a problem so let us look at the problem there are two problems so we have two tools that we have studied one is the series and one are the transforms right transforms we have a problem right at least in this case because the transform domain signal is a continuous frequency if you want to say it that way that means we can definitely not store this in computer so we have issues not useful for a series also has an issue what is the issue it is for periodic signal periodic signal why would you transmit a periodic signal right generally we want to transmit a periodic signal the information signal should be an a periodic signal otherwise there is no information in that signal right if you have these triangles and if you know that this is a periodic signal why would you keep on transmitting the triangles right so series has a problem engineering problem that this in concept is for periodic signal we do not like communication engineers do not like periodic signals at all now so we thought that let us go and construct a tool for a periodic signals so that we can use it but then we have a problem that this transformed signal is also continuous frequency so it seems that we are living in two bad worlds right at this moment and we will use uh, and study few more transforms and then we will see how we get rid of these two problems at the same time okay we have to wait it's a very good question though okay you have to wait for the climax shrimanti okay sir so um yeah, so here i was yes sir i think uh, the answer to her question would be that uh, there are some operations which are more uh, easier to do on uh, uh, on the frequency response uh, on the frequency domain uh, response of a signal uh, as compared to the time domain and i think there's a entire field of study uh, on why this is so and analyzing all this yeah part of the answer is correct uh, you are absolutely correct that it is easier to do operations on frequency domain it's perfectly correct but to do operations you have to first store it right and the storage part is critical right so we will see even in this uh, part that it is for example convolution is a very dif difficult thing to do practically but even to do any operation in frequency domain on x omega it's very tricky because the storage is not possible and computers does not work without the storing okay so from that point of view it's uh, it's correct operations are easier but let us see how can we store it okay two things will make it more useful so i had a question so you have written here the energy of the error signal tends to zero yeah. but like we don't have successive approximations here right like x omega capital x of omega is fixed 
and then from that x tilde d x tilde t is also fixed like where are the successive approximations so that we can say it, it is tending to zero so basically what it simply means is suppose my xt just as an example i have chosen this as xt okay now if i do its x omega i do not want to say what is x omega for this signal but let us say we have got a certain x omega then from this x omega when we are constructing xt tilde okay using these two equations you would see that this xt tilde will not be same as xt what this xt tilde would be it would be something like this my diagram will not be very correct but something like this okay now if you find out the error signal you will have something like this error signal the difference in the two signals would be something like this now because the error signals is different or exist only at countable points its energy will tend to zero that is the meaning so you can have xt tilde so basically the essential meaning of this equation is xt tilde can be different from xt at countable number of points if if there is a big if if xt is energy signal okay sir i think you can get the successive approximations by saying x tilde t equals to 1 by 2 pi minus capital n to capital n and then say when n tends to infinity then uh, e energy tends to zero yeah i didn't understand what did you say uh, x tilde t is equals to 1 by 2 pi minus n to n x omega e j omega t t omega that thing you just instead of minus infinity to infinity you day you say minus n to n and say when n tends to infinity then energy tends to zero so that yeah, way yeah. yeah yeah you can think uh, about successive approximations in that way but basically the physical meaning okay the physical meaning maths is just a tool but the physical meaning of this equation is this that xt tilde will can be different from xt at countable number of points and thus the energy in their signal will go to zero now that's the only one way to think about it there is another way to think about this is by dirichlet conditions again we have seen all of this in fourier series for dirichlet conditions the xt should be absolutely summable and xt should be well behaved and i again leave it to you to understand what is meant by xt being well behaved okay so you can read oppenheim it has lot of uh, details on what is meant by xt being well behaved so go through it and if you observe these two things then we can show that et tends to zero except at discontinuities okay you can also prove this and the formal proof of all of this we are not uh, looking at the proof but if someone is interested in looking at the proof proofs of all of this then you have to see plancherel's theorem okay i think in maths at some stage you may do this uh, these plancherel's theorem or you might have done it i don't know so formal proof of these things lies in plancherel's theorem and now there is a catch these things are sufficient conditions okay that means if uh, xt is a energy signal then you are guaranteed to have convergence of fourier series uh, sorry you are guaranteed to have convergence of fourier transforms but this is not a necessary condition these are sufficient conditions but these are not necessary conditions for example unit step ut 
This is neither absolutely integrable. It is neither an energy signal, but it has a Fourier transform. OK, so these are sufficient conditions, but these are not necessary conditions for the existence of Fourier transforms. In fact, in fact, what are the necessary conditions for existence of Fourier transforms is still an open research problem. And this is open like from for about uh, 300 years already. And no one has been able to solve or think about what are the necessary conditions for existence of Fourier transforms. So as a student, I encourage you to think about this problem and possibly come up with a solution and then you will be very famous. OK, so think about at least give some time. Sometimes very tricky things can be solved by thinking in simple terms. So I leave a problem to you. You think about what are the necessary conditions for existence of Fourier transform? Anyone who can solve this in the course will get definitely an A grade. OK, so that is the second way by which you can get an A grade in this course. Think about what are the necessary conditions for existence of Fourier transforms. OK, so I leave with you something to think about. OK, now let us do and uh, take it easy. And let us calculate the Fourier transform of this signal. Let us first do this. Everyone. Take a pen and paper and just do this. What's Fourier transform for this signal? Yeah, the correct answer is 1 upon A plus J omega. But even before attempting this, is this signal an important signal? Is this signal an important signal to be to be calculating its Fourier transform? Yes or no? And why yes? And why do you think it's yes? Because decaying exponentials are naturally occurring. Discharging capacitor, field in inductor, etc. So it is the solution of the accumulator that thing when we have feedback system. Yeah. So the basic CT system that we have seen basic CT system, the canonical CT system, which looks like something like this, right? You have to keep on remembering. This is the basic CT system, and at that time I have said that all CT systems should be constructed out of this basic CT system. And this basic CT system has an impulse response, which is like this. And thus a basic C, so this is the impulse response of a basic CT system. This is the precise answer. Of course, with feedback. OK, so that's why it's very, very important to understand what is the frequency response of a basic CT system. OK, so now let us see. So I think it's very straightforward, no complications. So this is the signal, right? And then we multiply this thing and integrate with respect to time. We are integrating with respect to time, so this should not be a function of time, right? This should only be a function of omega. So now 
ut we can absorb this in the limits so now we can remove this ut and change the limits from 0 to infinity and we can combine these two complex exponentials like this and then you know that x omega will be this signal what is mod of x omega mod of x omega will be this and what is angle of x omega angle of x omega will be this okay simple things right now there is an important concept which uh, which i will like to introduce and then possibly end this lecture um sir yeah so the fourth option was low pass filter i'm going to explain this once yeah it's a low pass filter this is also correct this is also correct this is also correct this is also correct so all options are correct the low pass filter means omega is less uh, omega tends to infinity then x omega should be zero yes okay okay so i will I, i will explain i am going to explain what is this low pass filter so first of all let me go and look at this mod of x omega which is this signal in little bit more detail because again this is an important uh, frequency response so this is the diagram of mod of x omega so i will write it again so as you can see that as omega increases this will keep on decreasing right it's an even function that's also is clear and when omega is zero then the value is 1 by a okay now when omega is a when omega is a this is what 1 by root 2a so when omega is a this is 1 upon 1 by root 2a and similarly because this is an even thing omega minus a this is also 1 by root 2a now there is an important concept in communication engineering and in other fields also is to calculate 3 db point what is 3 db point so normally and i think this we will prove in this tutorial or maybe next tutorial but sometimes we will prove this normally the peak value of mod of x omega normally not always but normally the peak value of mod of x omega is at omega equals to 0 and then you see for what frequencies for what value of frequency this mod of x omega decreases by 1 by root okay for example if you have the amplitude or amplitude is spectral density or whatever is 1 by a you want to find out for what value of omega the amplitude is spectral density is mod is 1 by root 2a so this frequency is known as 3 db frequency okay why is this known as 3 db you can use when we are thinking about db's we normally use this conversion 20 log 10 r where r is the ratios of the amplitude okay ratios of the amplitudes you can also think about db in terms of this relationship let me say p where p is the ratios of power so you can use either of the two so here because we are interested in the ratios of the amplitude spectral density so we will use this definition okay db so if my r is 1 what is in this in db 0 right 0 log 10 1 is 0 you can see when this r is root 2 then this is 3 when this r is 2 this will be 6 when this r is 10 what it would be 20 okay 
So 3 dB point corresponds to the frequency for which the amplitude reduces by root 2. OK. Clear? So I have already said this. So this is known as 3 dB, this frequency. This is known as 3 dB bandwidth. So normally if if I just look at one sided bandwidth, which is this range. This is one sided bandwidth. So bandwidth means for what range of frequencies. My amplitude lies above one by root two of its peak value. OK, of course, the two sided bandwidth will be this. Range. And you can see that because this is even the two sided bandwidth is twice one sided bandwidth. In communication engineering out of convention, we normally when we say bandwidth. OK, when you hear the word bandwidth. We normally mean one sided bandwidth. OK, this is just by notation and convention. So the bandwidth for this signal is a so one sided bandwidth for this signal or for this frequency response is a any question otherwise we will finish the lecture now so when we say bandwidth it's implicit that we're talking about one sided bandwidth right yes okay so Any other question? OK, thank you so much for attending this lecture. See you on Friday. I take care. Thank you, sir.